So Mike showed us an astonishing diversity of eyes and discovered a whole lot of exquisitely well-adapted novel optical mechanisms. And of course, as we've heard from Dan, all of these have evolved in order that animals can have the vision they need. Now, evolution is driven both by the benefits of, uh, of, of a particular adaptation, but it's also influenced by costs. So tiny, lots of animals have very small eyes, as Don Eric says, every eye, animal has the eye its needs, and they're very small, they have grotty little eyes because they don't need very good vision. And so the, the costs of a good eye outweigh the benefits. And so I think a lot of people would agree that if we're to better understand these adaptations, we should be looking at eyes through a cost-benefit lens. And Mike was very good at um, making new instruments that enabled us to see new stuff we've never seen before. And so I'm offering as my tribute to Mike a new in instrument, which is a cost-benefit lens with slightly better resolution. I think Mike would have liked the idea that this is totally new stuff that hasn't been published. So we start with what makes a good eye. Um, um, the, the New Testament says that <laughs> there are, are three factors. The first is the point spread function, which is what you would call is the blur. You want that to be as narrow as possible so you get a nice sharp image. The second is that you want your photoreceptors spaced close together at small angles so that you can resolve the difference between nearby objects. And the third is that you want to catch lots of photons to make the photon noise, the variance in the photon catch goes um, up as the um, number of photons. And it's photon noise which makes things look horrible and speckly at very low light levels when you don't have very many photons. So you want to get a good signal to noise ratio by increasing your photon catch. And we know partly through, if you go and look in the Old Testament of the Bible, um, you'll find all the equations you need and to work out that these three quality factors depend on the physical dimensions of the eye. So if you want the photoreceptors to subtend smaller angles, then you want to make either the radius of a compound eye or the focal distance of a lens eye, make that longer so that now the angle is reduced. If you want to make the lower circle narrower, you want to make the lens larger in diameter because that's the equation for the ultimate limit to the resolving power of a lens which is diffraction. And if you want a better signal to noise ratio, you want to make a longer photoreceptor, which catches more of the photons that come in, because that will increase as the square root of the number of photons. So everybody knows that there is an expense, a cost for having better vision. It is that you need a much bigger eye. And that's very good for a lot of purposes. And in fact, people have used eye radius, eye focal length, or axial length, length from top to bottom, or the area of the cornea of the eye as measures of cost, because they reflect bigger equals better. But these measures have rather poor resolution, because many eyes, are, for example, are not spherical. This compound eye, Although it is part of a sphere, it's in fact a shell on the, an outer shell of a sphere. And this inner part of the eye isn't occupied at all. And many so-called, and, and many simple eyes are actually tubular, for example, or distorted in weird and wonderful manner. Yes. And the second and maybe even more serious problem is that when an animal invests in an eye, it invests in both photoreceptors and in some optical mechanism for focusing the light into the photoreceptors. And in these 
simple measures, the costs of the optics and photoreceptors are all lumped together. And so we're not really seeing very much about costs and benefits. And so we're going to, I'm going to introduce a new measure of cost, which is quite simple to derive in principle, well, there are some equations, some geometry, called specific volume, which is the volume of devoted to an angle as per angle of visual space, not the total volume of the eye, but the volume per angle of space that you're looking at. And I think that improves, <laughs> we'll see that it improves the cost benefit um, lenses resolving power. So best way to introduce this is just to show how it's done. So we'll take the apposition compound eye of an insect, which has an array of lenses, and under at least focus the light onto photoreceptors here, which then absorb them. And you can see that this eye is locally spherical, and the volume of the optics is simply the volume of this outer shell. And the volume of the photoreceptor array is simply the volume of this next shell in here. And there are equations for geometry which give you those and the volume of the entire eye. Now, the interesting thing about these equations is that they contain the factors R and D, which is and delta phi, R is D and delta phi, so they contain the radius of the eye, D and delta phi, because that's R, and the focal distance, focal length, and the lens, and the length of the photoreceptors. And those are all the factors which determined our three quality factors. Longer length, bigger D, and longer F gives you better spatial resolution, and the longer L gives you a better signal to noise ratio. So these measure, this measure, these measures of costs are directly related to the ability of the eye to form and capture an image. So they can they link the volumes are directly linked to the our three quality factors: the blur, the signal to noise ratio, and the angular density of photoreceptors. And mm -hmm. the equations are given by physics and geometry, and by physiology, and they're very, very simple. This equation here, that the signal to noise maximum is a quarter times the square root of some constant times the length, needs a little bit of explanation because it may be unfamiliar to you, to many people in the room. But this is a discovery made by photoreceptor physiologists that the number of microvilli that a photoreceptor makes in an insect eye determines its signal to noise ratio. And the, the principle is quite, that sounds really scary, but the principle is quite simple. So the photoreceptor absorbs light using a column of photopigment with photosensitive membrane. And this column is made out of tiny little fingers pushed out and packed together called microvilli. And Roger Hardy and colleagues show that each microvillus processes a sig the signal from a single photon when it's absorbed. But it takes time to process that signal. So a single microvillus can only process at a maximum about 100 photons per second. So in very bright light, so as you increase the light intensity, so this is the rate at which photoreceptor, this is measurements that I made with John Anderson, um, where we were able to estimate the rate at which a photoreceptor was absorbing photons, and then looking at the noise, work out the rate at which it must be transducing these photons, converting them into little signals. And you can see at low light levels, the rate increases with the rate at which pigment is absorbing in these microvilli. But as you get to higher light levels, because it takes time to process a signal, some of the microvilli are not able to process the photons that they've just absorbed because they're already processing light. And so the rate at which you're transducing photons falls 
below the rate at which you're absorbing photons. And it turns out that this means that the signal to noise ratio stops climbing. And in fact, it goes through a maximum, which is this value of a quarter of the square root of the number of microvilli. And that comes from both the theory of the binomial statistics of this absorption process, but also has been shown in experiments and by modeling. So this is a hard limit. And it's a real limit. And this makes it very convenient because this is a very simple equation here. So for our first model of this cost-benefit lens, we can use this very simple equation if we consider just fly photoreceptors, which are what these are, which are operating under very bright light conditions when this happens. And you'll see that in this, these experiments, we looked at two photoreceptors, one of which has a long, is a long photoreceptor, 250 microns long, and another one is shorter. And you can see that the longer one does indeed transduce more photons in bright light. So it all properly works. So the other question, that, the obvious next question is, well, how well does do our two measures of cost, the volume per solid angle of the optics and the volume per solid angle of the photoreceptor array, how, how well do they represent the real costs of the eye? Well, the first cost is space. And of course, this is an exact. The second is mass, well, it's heavy. So it's reasonable to assume that the density is about one because everything in biology is made of water to a first approximation. So that's a, a reasonable approximation. Materials, it's a bit dodgy to assume they're all the same, but the cost is probably relatively small compared to the other ones. So for a first pass through the problem, our lens won't have perfect resolution, but it might still show us something. The real problem is with energy. So there are two energy costs. One is the energy cost of carrying the eye as you're moving around in flight, and that's proportional to mass, especially when you're flying. That's okay. But these photoreceptors consume more energy per unit volume of photoreceptor than most tissues in the body because they have to use a lot of energy to convert all those photons <coughs> into electrical signals. So this is not going to work. We're going to have to find some way of accounting for the extra energy consumption of photoreceptors. And the way in which we do this is we adopt a method which was being used by biologists who are interested in weapons. So. These are the weapons of stag beetles. So the male has this giant jaws here, which it uses to fight other males and to display to females. So how much does that cost? And what they simply did was say, okay, when the stag beetle flies, it's going to cost energy to lift this thing off the ground and carry it around. And so you take the specific metabolic rate, that's the energy per gram, of the flying insect, that's the cost of flying, energy cost of flying a gram measured in the laboratory. And you simply multiply that by the weight of this weapon, and that gives you the energy used to, to fly that weapon around. And so we apply this to the eye. In the eye, people have measured the, the, okay, the specific metabolic rate is oxygen consumption per gram. And these people here did fantastic experiments where they measured this for the eyes of a blowfly. So we can work out from their values what the oxygen consumption per microvillus is. And then if we divide that by the specific metabolic rate, like in the flying beetles, we get an equivalent mass. And then we convert that because the density is one to a volume. And so we've converted energy to volume through this trick. And we calculate that the, from data, very little data on this, but our best estimate is that the energy ranges from between 0.05 and 0.05 cubic microns per microvillus, which is quite significant because the volume of the microvillus, the true volume of the microvillus 
is only 0.2 microns cubed. So the total specific cost of RI is going to be the specific cost of the optics volume, the specific cost of the photoreceptor volume, and this <laughs> energy surcharge added on here, where this is a factor, the energy per microvillus is an equivalent volume of steroid. Okay, so now we have all of the equations that make our lens work. Let's apply it and see if we can see anything new. And we looked at published data on the compound eyes of diurnal flies because this is the best data set available. And we made some simplifying assumptions and they all perform roughly the same function. So that's kind of what okay to do. And so what we're going to do is we're going to modelize and we're going to, on the computer, and we're going to make eyes of different configurations, but of the same cost. So eyes of, sorry, they're the same configuration. They're all acquisition eyes, but they have different dimensions for their components. So they all have all of these eyes that we construct have the same cost. So believe it or not, these two eye regions have the same cost. That's because when you go out and everything gets longer when you move from the center of the sphere. And this one has invested heavily in lenses and less heavily in photoreceptors and vice versa. And the result is going to be that here you're going to have very sharp image, but it's going to be very noisy. But here the image is more blurred, but it's, um, it's much more reliable. Now, it's quite difficult to look at these two things and say, well, which one of those do I really prefer, which is best? So we want a measure of performance. And you could use lots of measures of performance because we, we're talking about these universal factors that influence everything, the quality of the image of the eye. Um, you could use some of Dan's new measures or you could use small target detection or something. But we chose to use information capacity in bits of information per solid angle per second, because this is a general measure of all of the information that's available for you to see. And in fact, it's the one that Don used when he did his brilliant paper on I evolution. If we have time, we might return to it. So, okay. So we make all of these eyes all have the same cost. And then we work out how much information each eye is going to be able to capture what its capacity is, and then we plot them out and compare them. And what you get is this rather grand thing, which in other areas of physiology is called a performance surface, that's just a surface, across morphospace, where morphospace is just all of the possible configurations of I that you could make at the same cost. And you can see that there is a, an optimum a best configuration which maximizes performance, but the optimum is rather broad. These red areas, performance is 95% of maximum. Now, this is bad news for people who like to write papers saying that everything in the world is optimized, but good news for insects, because it means you can specialize your eye for better signal-to-noise ratio by sacrificing optics, or by CRISPR images by sacrificing signal to noise ratio without losing more than 5% of your general performance vision. And one of the things that people have always observed is that in these compound eyes in particular, everything is exquisitely fine tuned. There are loads and loads of minor adjustments. And this makes sense because in fact, if you make a minor adjustment for one function, you're not going to suffer greatly for another function. And so this makes minor adjustments much more um, profitable. Well, does it tell us anything useful about the structure of eyes? Well, we can apply our method to work out how much volume is given to the photoreceptors in a compact fly eye as a function, as, as a percentage of the total volume of the eye. And you can see that in these flies, between 50 and 80% of the volume is photoreceptors. And the theory says that you want, a, you want a zero energy cost, you want to 
give a very large volume of the eyes to photoreceptors because they're cheaper. If you increase the energy cost, the volume you devote reduces, but it's still high. And the data falls somewhere between these two theoretical predictions. So we conclude that in fact, lots of volume is being given to photoreceptors because this is an efficient way to this bit makes an efficient eye. And of course, the, the photoreceptors, the volume of photoreceptors is long because the photos is high because the volume, the, the volume is high because the photoreceptors are very long. They get to be something like in flies 300 microns long. A single cone in your retina, the equivalent structure is only something like 20 microns long. So these are really long photoreceptors. And in fact, as Don Eric has shown, they, these apposition insect eyes have the world's longest photoreceptors, even though they operate in purely bright light. And this helps to explain why. This is an efficient way of using your resources. And so what you see is that as you invest more in the eye, you have larger lenses, narrower angles between homotidia, and that gives you better spatial acuity, and the length of the photoreceptors increases. So in fact, the investment in photoreceptors is matched to the investment in optics. So the acuity and length increase in step. And this is seen almost everywhere you look in acquisition compound eyes. So if these acquisition, if this is a particular character of acquisition eyes that they have really long photoreceptors compared to simple eyes, then if we build an equivalent model of a simple eye, which we do just in this state here, you should see that the, you, sh you should find that the simple eye photoreceptors, which are the solid line theoretical predictions, they should be much shorter. And indeed they are. For zero energy cost, the difference is from there to there. And for high energy costs, the difference is from there to there. But you see another thing. You see in the theory that when you impose an energy cost, a small energy cost, it has a tiny in influence I've got these two the wrong way around. That should be point for Oh no, I've got it the right way around. It has very little influence on the optimum length. But when you apply the same energy cost to the simple eye photoreceptors and then apply an even smaller energy cost, you find that there's a very big change. So the simple eyes are much more sensitive to photo photoreceptor energy costs. And that's simply, and that's basically because as you see from this comparison here, in the simple eye, the photoreceptors are more closely packed. So in the compound eye, the volume costs of the photoreceptors are much higher relative to the energy, energy costs. And so this has profound, makes a profound influence on the design of the eye. And you can see this when you take the photoreceptor energy costs in our models as a function of eye size, where this is photoreceptor energy as a percentage of the total cost of the model eye. And in a compound eye, it starts off quite high. And then as you make the eye bigger, it becomes smaller and smaller. And that's because these photoreceptors are getting spaced further and further apart. In the simple eye, but high energy costs, even though the photoreceptors are very, very short, the energy cost is now the dominant cost in the eye. It's over 60%. And that's because the photoreceptors are really tight packed in simple eyes. So what have we seen? So I hope we see that this very pompous Microcated is deriving performance surfaces <laughs> over morphospace 
is useful. We actually do see stuff with this lens that we haven't seen before. <laughs> and we see that photoreceptor costs shape the entire eye because they are competing for the resources that are invested in the eye. And this, so what this means is that if you spend more on photoreceptors, you have to spend less on optics. So the optics are all smaller. So you can't really look at the two in, in isolation. And we also see that the impact of the energy costs depends on eye type. So you can't come along and say, well, people have found this thing about energy costs in an insect eye, and it's going to have the same effect on a lizard's eye because their, their geometries. And finally, we see that when we look at eyes, we find that the investments in optics and photoreceptors are very carefully matched to maximize efficiency. And this is a new principle of the design of eyes. Now, looking ahead, I think our cost benefit lens can evolve to improve its resolution. And we know how this is done. You have to adapt it to get rid of all sorts of defects and artifacts and actually. Um, and so to begin with, it can be adapted to view eyes of any shape or size. We have formulated this approach and shown that it's useful using these compound eyes where the geometry is very simple. But the principle is that the shape the size of a component in the eye and its constituents determine the eye's performance. So in principle, you can apply this approach to any eye component of arbitrary shape or size. And we now have fantastic methods for imaging the structure of eyes within eyes and wonderful modeling techniques, which can tell you how weird blobs behave optically. The second thing is we applied it to very bright light levels to simplify our proof of principle. But in fact, um, my co-author on the study, Fran Hernandez and I, Heras and I, who's Hernandez Heras. So anyway, Fran Heras and I um, developed a very simple simulation in which you can work out how many photons a given array of microvilli is absorbing at any light level. So we're not just stuck to looking at bright light, you can look at dim light too. And I can give you a practical example of how you might want to apply this. So this is Don Eriks and Helga's famous paper from 1996, where they tested the Darwin's theory of the evolution of the lens eye that you start off with a plate, a little, um, and then you bend it slightly and that gives it some vestige of tiny angular sensitivity and you bend it more and more so you end up with a little pinhole and that works like a pinhole camera and then you introduce a lens here and that starts to focus the light and that makes it much much better and Mike Land famously when talking about this famously said that this is a critical stage and any lump of stuff put in there would improve the performance of the eye. Even a lump of snot, he <laughs> said. So we could apply this method to Mike's lump of snot. And I think it would work very well. So I have lots of thank yous to say. So first, thank you to Fran, who in fact did all of the modeling and formulated the project with me. And also, so lots of people I've worked with, some of whom are in this room, on the visual ecology uh, uh, of photoreceptors and you know, on photoreceptor costs as an important factor in eye design. And I also have to think, thank all of you in the room who are visual neuroscientists who share the same interests because we are, it's such great fun to work with you all. And the reason is because we, we're proud in our work, but we're not proud in people, proud as people. And we like to share things and we like to work with each other. And we want, just want to discover stuff 
because it's important and it's fun. It should all be fun. And I think we have to give a big thank you to Mike for that. Um, years and years ago, um, we were discussing, this, uh, I was discussing with a group of colleagues rivalry in scientific fields and how dreadful it could be. And this person told me that this particular branch of, of chemistry, I won't reveal it to you, was notorious for everybody being really cutthroat and nasty to each other and trying to steal things and publish them first and all this sort of stuff. And he said it was because the first two people who discovered the technique that got this field going were bitter rivals and really jealous of each other. And that tradition has just carried on. And I think Mike has played a seminal role in creating a tradition in our field which has made it more productive and emphasizes something that we science should be fun. So thank you, Mike. So there are any questions, don't ask me to explain the equations. Is there any, <laughs> any questions? Yeah. Hi. Good to see you. Uh, one of the four. Uh, I'm wondering if you could support the two main components of energy as opposed to the nuclear context. One is to do with the construction force, I suppose, or building complex structures and so on. And the other is to do with running those structures. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the second one, I suppose, also implies quite a lot of management in terms of provision of energy and collection of waste and so on and so forth. So, so, so I guess my guess is that you were talking about the command of the second. Yeah. We, we were talking about the retina's energy build. So the current feeling in the field is that you make this eye and you build this brilliant optics and then you build this brilliant retina, which is adapted and you put them together and you don't actually care about how much you pay for each of them. and and. And the energy bill is just something annoying that you have to pay on top of everything else. And it's going to be big, but that's, hey, that's, that's vision. The answer to your second, so, the, so you make a very good point that photoreceptors are not only more active from second to second as they are transducing, they cost much more to maintain because stuff is continually turning over, particularly the visual pigment and stuff wears out. And of course, they're more difficult, they're more expensive to build um, because they're much more complicated cells. Now, all of those costs are accommodated, can be accommodated within that energy factor. It's just a question, this, this is one of the improvements to the lens that we would like to see. We need a much better understanding of, of actually the, the costs that are involved. Um, of course, it, the thing is, you know, once you built a rubbish lens, then there's now selective pressure to actually improve the quality of that lens because the rubbish lens tells you, hey, this eye has become more useful and it can get even more useful still. So I hope people will start looking, in fact, more critically and uh, in more depth at, at a lot of these costs. And we, some of our preconceptions could well be overturned. Okay. I wanted if there are any examples in the world which sort of back, you know, don't um, fit with your equation and then seem to be completely inefficient and not explain that. Oh, I haven't really, yeah, that's a yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a really good question. Um uh it would I, mean they're sort of still evolving, or does it mean you're massive? <laughs> <laughs> um well there's plenty of things. The, the fits are not perfect, it's, it's a trend, because there's plenty of things we haven't taken account of. The maths is right, it's the numbers that you put into the maths, which could be wrong. Um, and there might be a better way of actually dealing with the costs in the first place, but until you take this method and break it, then, then it's a start. As I say, it's a lens, it's not terribly good, but it's better than the previous lenses. And it, given time <laughs> and effort, it will evolve. Oh, so, I have one question. 
uh, think about the signal to noise ratio, um, like in photography, right? You could make exposure longer. And is, is it possible that some animals live in a slow world? This is another thing that actually that we worked on, and that is that fast vision is more expensive than slow vision because the photoreceptors have to use more energy to change their signals very quickly to keep up with what's going on. And we actually know a lot about the biophysics of that. And so you can equate the time resolving power of the photoreceptors, which is a factor in this information capacity with energy consumption. We didn't build that into the model because it just makes the, it sort of, you know, makes the, the microscope that much more the lens that much more complicated. And we really wanted to show that this was a reasonable way to start moving it. But yes, that would be an obvious next step. And I think the, the method could deal with that. The equations can deal with it. And we know the mistakes. The problem is when you're building in more for space, every time you add a new dimension, everything goes up as the power of whatever it is you're, you're looking at. And, and so you end up with some very, very elaborate models. And probably what we need is Mike to come along and boil it all down to some very simple <laughs> equations that you can write on the back of an envelope. And once upon a time I did this, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to say one more thing about Mike making science fun. Uh, he always said, you, you don't start your research with a hypothesis. You go out and see what's out there. When he went out on the ship, he went out to have a good time. See what was see what was in the water, and then you start getting new ideas. That, yeah. That's what's fun about science is looking for something new, not discovering you already know something and proving it's true. So, thanks. So I've got a question. I think it's a naive, not behind the I couldn't really think of myself. But it's pointed for Dan as well as you. So that jumping spider with different sized eyes, uh, it's using different cost-benefit systems. I'm just wondering what those why. Do, what, what kind of function do these different sized eyes subserve? Does that relate to? So, so do you want me to answer so this? Yeah, so yeah, okay. 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 Uh, so, yeah. These, the jumping spider's eyes are different sizes. Um, we actually have a pretty good idea about why they're different sizes okay. and why they have eye movements. So, the frontal eyes, or as they're medial eyes, or whatever you are, get very confused. They have great big lenses. Fantastic resolving power. Yes. And they have very long focal lengths so that the interoceptor angles are very small. So they have very fantastic spatial discrimination. Their discrimination is about um, one fifth as good as ours, which is amazing. But it's, is that about right? I think. Yeah. I went to a lecture on this. Yeah, thing. but it's also a very small part of the visual field. And it's, right. but the thing is that that. The eye is as long as the spider's body almost. So it has this tiny little patch of photoreceptors, which are attacked by attached to the lens by this long sock. And as Mike showed, muscles move this little the end of the sock around so it looks in different directions. And just to as the icing on the cake, before the light reaches the photoreceptors it's refracted by a depression in the photoreceptor layer, which is equivalent to the foveal pit that you right. find in birds and in uh, birds of prey and also in chameleons. And um, McIntyre and Williams showed that this acts, this makes, this converts the eye it acts as a diverging lens, so it converts the eye into a Galilean telescope, a pair of opera glasses, increases the magnification. And the thing that all these three animals share in common is that their eyes touch some part of the body, so you can't make them any longer in length. So you, they've evolved this telephoto pit first. Um, so, and then the other eyes yes. get progressively smaller and smaller as they go more progressively. And that's the equivalent of your visual acuity falling off yes. as you move towards the periphery, because you need those other eyes to tell to centralize what they should be looking at. Right. So that's more about optic flow. 
so they do optic flow and, 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 and all of these sorts of things. Um, and in fact, the, the, the observation, um, casual observation suggests that in the longer focal length, well, no, in fact, there's a very nice paper just come out on recently on the development of these eyes in spiders uh, by Elke Buschbach. And as the eyes grow, they get longer focal lengths. And as the focal lengths get longer, the photoreceptor gets longer, which is what our model predicts. And also, within a single instar, the eyes with the bigger lenses and longer focal lengths have longer receptors. So that kind of fits our model with that. I didn't pay them to ask this. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thanks everybody for listening to this.